please. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Madeline Meddy, and I'm a marine paleoclimatologist, and I'm currently based in Bergen, Norway, as a postdoctoral researcher. Thank you to ASLO and the editors and session conveners for this opportunity. I'm really excited to present here among such a broad swath of the ASLO community. And in that light, I wanted to um, introduce and advertise my specialization. And hopefully you'll be, it'll be new to you and maybe attractive as um, some techniques you can apply to your own research or even consider collaboration. So I'll first tell you simply what sclerochronology is and I'll give you a few examples of how these methods are applied in climatology and environmental studies. And I'll finish with some notes and thoughts about directions in the field and where I'd like to go with my own research. The textbook definition of sclerochronology is the study of physical and chemical variations in the accretionary hard tissues of organisms and the temporal context in which they're formed. So I will expand on the three key aspects of this definition, which are accretionary hard tissues, temporal context, and the physical and chemical variations. First um, is the physical archive itself, which are accretionary hard parts built by organisms. These are organisms that build skeletons or shells or certain types of bone structures. Uh, for example, bivalve mollusks are um, are one example and one that I'll focus on in my presentation, but we can also look at things like gastropods, including limpets, um, corals, coral and algae, and fish otoliths. And I wanted to say more about fish otoliths, but I think the next talk is focused on that, so I'll leave it to that. Uh, temporal context is the second key component of sclerochronology. The structures we are interested in have some form of a time marker embedded within them. Um, we call these growth lines or growth increments or growth bands. And very analogous to tree rings, these are often formed annually in many species. But in faster growing or shorter lived species, they can um, be, they are dependent on tidal variations or daily or monthly um, periodicity as well. Um, these organisms are also sometimes subject to disturbance from either predation or upwelling events or other environmental events. And so, Understanding the context of these growth lines within the structures is often the first piece of the puzzle in doing a sclerochronological study. So these pictures here show some examples of these growth lines. Um, this is the common cockle shell, and as with most bivalves, you can examine the growth lines on the exterior of the shell, but on many organisms, you have to make a cross-section of the structure to observe the annual growth, growth increments. So next to that, we have a, a fish otolith, and this is a, below that is a bivalve showing distinct and variable annual growth lines. Here's a parietes coral that has, they tend to have rather complacent growth rates, but clear annual growth lines. You can also identify growth markers in coral and algae is the last picture there with the sort of more complex growth structure, but um, distinct annual growth. And to complete our definition, we need a measurement of these archives. So this can be something physical like growth rate or crystal structure, but the hallmark of um, sclerochronological measurements are um, geochemical measurements. So we love measuring oxygen isotope ratios or stable carbon isotope ratios as proxies for sea surface temperature or carbon dynamics or diet. Um, radiocarbon is a useful measurement in many archives if you're interested in understanding reservoir age or ocean circulation. Elemental ratios and concentrations are also useful proxies. They do tend to be somewhat species dependent. And um, other chemical variations as well. There's a lot of development in this field and a lot of rapid advancement. So uh, much room for innovation here. Again, this is a very rapidly growing field. And frankly, probably one of the reasons why it um, included me in this session with my more recent publication. Uh, this is an intro from a recent special issue that shows publications using one species, Arctica Icelandica, in green, and some other sclerochronological archives in orange. And really in the last decade or two, um, there's been really rapid advancement in, in these techniques, application of these techniques. And I think that will continue to grow. There's a lot of new students that have just been trained in this field. So moving on to some case studies, um, I'm going to focus a lot on the marine bivalve, Arctica Icelandica. It's also known as the mahogany clam or the ocean quahog. And I focus on this species for two reasons. First, 
this is what I have the most experience with, so I, I know the most about it. And second, it's truly the premier sclerochronological archive in our field for several reasons. It's extremely long-lived. Individuals of this species can live for many centuries, up to 500 years. They are widely distributed across the North Atlantic at many depths, ranging from 5 to 200 or 300 meters. Um, they have annual growth increment, distinct annual growth increments, and they are um, sedentary on the seafloor. And for this reason, they don't move around throughout their lifetimes. For this reason, we often can also nickname them the sentinels of climate change, because once they settle to the seafloor, they're subject to changing temperatures and food conditions in their surrounding, which influence their physical and geochemical characteristics recorded in their shells annually for many centuries throughout their lifetimes. As a fun fact, um, this species is commercially fished still in the Gulf of Maine, and so if you've had clam chowder recently, you may have tasted this clam, and it's perhaps one of the oldest foods you've ever eaten. Um, and the last thing on this slide, I want to highlight, this is the cross-section of, of, of a shell showing the growth increments, and this highlights another really key component of most sclero studies. This shell was collected in 2014, and so we can identify that last little bit of growth as the year 2014, and then at first pass we can count back each annual increment um, year by year to establish a chronology for this shell. Um, now this is a rather young shell, so these increments are very clear and easily read. However, this species does exhibit an exponential decline in growth rates, so after the 30th or 50th year, these increments are really teeny tiny and sometimes hard to, to see and distinguish and measure accurately. Also, they can experience disturbance, and this disturbance can often cause them to, to um, lay down a growth line that looks similar to an annual um, growth line. So, but we have an advantage with some techniques we have in this field. One thing you may notice is that there's variability among these growth increments. For example, 2013 is a very small year. And if we look at other shells in the same population, they're going to exhibit a similar relative pattern in, in growth rate. So 2013 will, be, will stand out as a particularly small year in, these pop, in this population. Um, and this allows us to measure many shells and, like a barcode, make sure they all match up so we haven't misidentified any increments and in our chronology our time chronology from these records is absolute with no error. This process is called cross-dating. And it also, it's what they use is we borrowed it exactly from dendrochronology, and it also allows us to, to measure dead collected shells from the beach or subfossil shells. And by, again, aligning these barcodes and relying on very long-lived in individuals, we can overlap them in time and really extend the chronology truly many centuries. Okay, so the first example I'm going to give you some details about is from the study that brought me here to this session. This is from my PhD work and continues to be a large component of my research. Um, our group is very interested in understanding uh, surface ocean circulation components as part of larger Atlantic Ocean overturning circulation. And so we identified a site in far northern Norway where there is a healthy and um, pristine population of Arctic Icelandica shells in a region heavily influenced by the North Atlantic Current, which is an extension of the Gulf Stream. And from these shells, we constructed a shell growth chronology out of many dozens of them. This is the black line in the plot here. It now extends almost five, more than 500 years. And from some of these shells, we collected annual oxygen isotopic measurements. The first paper presenting these records is an exploratory analysis of the first hundred years of these records and makes comparisons between these proxies and sea surface temperatures in the region and other climate indices. And more recently we've expanded these records. This is work in progress. We've been filling some gaps. And so far our findings show that we have strong correspondence with and persistence of large-scale temperature trends in the North Atlantic recorded in this location, and we can identify the timing and magnitude of the coolest parts of the Little Ice Age into the modern warming. So stay tuned for more um, from this work. The second case study comes from the same location in far northern Norway, but these are ecologists and biologists seeking to understand what controls bivalve activity in the environment. And so what they've done is attached electrode sensors to each valve of a shell, and this is to monitor their gaping activity, or how they're opening and closing. 
And so they attached these sensors to many shells, put them each in a little cup, and loaded them onto a benthic lander, which is also equipped with a myriad of other environmental sensors. And they measured the gaping and the environment for a period of several years. Some of their findings are shown here. The box plots in each, in each graph show the summary statistics of the bivalve activity. And from top to bottom is also plotted uh, chlorophyll concentration, turbidity, light levels, and temperature. And the main findings here in this paper are that um, gaping is really very synchronous within the population. They're all behaving the same way throughout the year and they're responding mostly to food quality and quantity. And the next step in this is to tie this gaping activity, bivalve activity, with shell growth, shell growth rates. And the final study involves environmental lead concentrations. Um, this group of authors presented in one of their papers a summary plot of environmental lead concentrations, or lead concentrations recorded in shells and color coded, coded on the plot the, their proximity to sources of environmental lead pollution. And so this helped establish that this measurement in shells is a good proxy for lead concentrations. And in fact, there's some other studies who apply this technique in a more time series fashion to look at changing environmental lead pollution through time um, in specific environments. So for future work, um, some ideas here. New species are always a target and um, they do need to be tested and calibrated for their reliability as environmental proxies. We're especially interested in very long-lived, low-latitude, and especially southern hemisphere species, which there's a shortage of. I think environmental monitoring is another exciting direction. I was thinking that, um, for example, the Muscle Watch program in the US that uh, periodically samples muscle tissues to monitor environmental pollution, and I think perhaps they could involve a shell component or a shell growth component in those um, assessments. Incorporating something like sclerochronologies and ecosystem assessments will help get that baseline environmental variability component to understanding specific environments. From the climate perspective, more sclerochronologies means more basin scale um, composites or reconstructions to, to highlight um, large-scale climate change, which is a hot topic. And finally, really digging in and looking at specific environments, comparing sclerochronologies from several species with perhaps different life history traits could yield some really interesting insights into environmental change. So thank you for listening to my talk. You can ask me some questions now or find me afterwards or email me. And if you do find any potential sclerochronological archives at your field sites, I'd be happy to consult with you or point you in the right direction. So thank you.